Well, welcome everyone to this. The rise of the left resistance and solidarity. My name's Rachel Boothroyd, and I'm a contributing editor at Alborada, as well as a member of the board at Venezuela Analysis, and I'll be doing my best to chair this session today. From its independence, wars in the early 1800s to resistance against the dictatorships of the 20th century, through to the social movements which are fighting against neoliberalism and neocolonialism today, Latin America is a continent which has been a vanguard of emancipatory thought and social struggle. On a personal note, I lived in Venezuela for many years, firstly under the revolutionary government of Hugo Chavez, and then under his successor, Nicolás Maduro. And what always astounded me was the breadth, creativity, strength, and sheer tirelessness of the social and popular movements there. So despite what I can only describe as suffocating sanctions and a de facto embargo from the United States, Venezuelan movements have never given up building the better world they dream of through action in their everyday lives via communal councils and communes or retreated from the broader political struggle at hand. As we know, the government of Hugo Chavez formed part of the so-called pink tide of progressive governments, which came to power in Latin America in the late 1990s and 2000s including Bolivia, Ecuador, and Brazil, as well as others. And despite commentary that Latin America's experiment with progressive politics had ended, the continent is once again riding a wave of victories for the left. This reminds us of former Bolivian Vice President Alvaro Garcia Linera's observation that struggle is cyclical and defeat is never final. We are in hard times, but hard times are what a revolutionary breeds. We fight, we win, we fall, we get up. We fight, we win, we fall, we get up. Until our lives are over, that is our destiny. In Chile, we have seen the election of Gabriel Boric, the first leftist president to have been elected since socialist president Salvador Allende was overthrown in a US-backed coup in 1973. In Colombia, Gustavo Petro and the historic pact were elected in June on a pledge to bring an end to the decades-long violence of the country's civil war and to prioritize social and climate justice. He is the first leftist president in the country's history. Both of these victories are not only historic and hard fought, but they were also made possible by the eruption of huge social movements and working class protest in 2019. In Brazil, the, workers, the worker parties Lula da Silva looks poised to win the elections again after a coup against them in 2016, which ended the presidency of Dilma Rousseff, saw Lula imprisoned and paved the way for the election of the ultra-right politician Jair Bolsonaro. And meanwhile, Bolivia has emerged victorious after returning to democracy and a mass or a movement to socialism led government under Luis Arce, following a coup against the government of Evo Morales, the country's first indigenous president in 2019. We have an incredible panel of speakers here today to shed light on all of these victories and to discuss the challenges facing the left in Latin America and most notably from Western imperialism, which includes our own mainstream media. First of all, we have Claudia Torbetelov here. Uh, Claudia is a Bolivian activist, trade unionist, and coordinator of WeFalas across the world, as well as a Labour Party councillor in Hackney South. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to my left, we also have Natalia Orban. Um, Natalia is a Brazilian journalist who contributes to several outlets, including Brazil Wire, Brazil 247, Jacob in Brazil, and others. Welcome, Natalia. <laughs> We're also really privileged to have with us Maria Jose Pizarro, who is a senator with the Historic Pact Coalition, 
which recently won Colombia's presidential election and now forms the country's first leftist government. <laughs> We also have with us today a surprise guest, Jeremy Corbyn, the former leader. A man who possibly needs no introduction from me. <laughs> and we also have John McAvoy, a British investigative journalist who focuses on UK foreign policy and who regularly contributes to media outlets such as Declassified UK and others. And last but not least, Pablo Navarrete, who is a journalist and documentary filmmaker focusing on Latin America, and he is the founder and co-editor of Alborada, and he also runs Alborada Films. <laughs> So what we're going to do for the rest of the session is we're going to hear briefly from each of our speakers and then we'll open the floor up so you can all ask your burning questions and I'm sure you'll have many. So Claudia, I'm going to pass the mic over to you for you to kick us off. Yay. Thank you. Hola everyone. Um, it's pretty amazing to be here today. I want to start by explaining a word that I will use uh, to open and close today's intervention uh, talking about Bolivia, which is Hayalla. Hayalla means long live. It's the indigenous language to celebrate life. So I want to begin by saying a big Hayalla to the world transformed, to Alborada, to everyone in the team, to everyone here today, to our surprise guest, which is always a revolutionary leader who is so, he shows his solidarity for Latin America every day, in and out. And I want to say that I hope that you leave today inspired, committed, and very clear what you need to do to, co to continue to support the Latin American movement, our victories as well as our struggles. There is a little bit of an echo in the microphone, isn't it? So you could hear me a bit twice. So it's two for one, two for one. <laughs> it's the generosity of socialism, socialism isn't it? <laughs> Radical, aren't we? So we really go for it. Right, so just to put into context, sorry, I'm going to start my timer. Uh, just to put into context uh, what the position of the plurinational state of Bolivia is within the current crisis that happens around the world, I'm just going to start by quoting the message of President Luis Arce Catacora at the recent United Nations uh, session. He said that there is a multiple and systematic capitalist crisis increasingly putting humanity and our planet, our Pachamama, at great risk. That there is an economic, social, food, climate, energy, water, and commercial crisis. And that we really need to identify the origin of the problem that continues to produce domination, exploitation, and exclusion of the greatest majorities, and continues to concentrate the wealth in the hands of a few and prioritizes the production of capital before the production of life. So in other words, humanism before, before profit, whilst protecting our Pachamama, is what is key, the key message of the Bolivian people in our, in our socialist revolution. So what can we learn from Bolivia today? Um, let's understand why we fight, and I really love the introduction. We fight, we resist, we fall, and we got up again. But in Bolivia, we have 16 years of phenomenal revolution, and I want you today to learn a bit more why we fight, why we resist, and why Bolivia will never, ever return to neoliberalism. <laughs> so the first lesson, thank you. We're pretty determined. <laughs> the first lesson that we need to learn is that since the election of his first indigenous president, Evo Morales Aima, and the social movements and the trade unions, there is a revolutionary process of change, and that is the word I really want you to keep that term, process of change, proceso de cambio. 
which is a process in which we, Bolivia, are prepared to defend with our life if necessary. And you will learn now why I say we are alive very soon when I explain to you what the process of change has done for Bolivia. El proceso de cambio, or process of change, is said to read all imperialist colonial practices across the country, to the deepest of fabrics in our societies and nations, reversing what for decades and almost centuries neoliberal governments and leaders did to favor the few and enslave and proactively make invisible the many. So this government had historically bled our national resources, a uh, bled dry, uh, creating unmeasurable accumulated wealth for themselves and also for the uh, Euro's empires, mining our silver, taking our gold, stealing, stealing everything that they could. And also, which is I want to mention is very relevant to what is happening in the recently announced uh, relaxation that exists for the private sector in here is that it gave a special contracts, a special tax cut, and the most, for me as, as a Bolivian national, it allocated lands in the thousands of hectares for these private sectors that then they went to exploit them and not give anything back to the communities. Something similar that I think is a story over here, you might say. So, these highly subsidized reduced rates gave in return. Uh, to the working class, high levels of poverty, illnesses, because of the deregulated labor practices that happened. He attacked our trade unions, and nothing was regulated in terms of the labor uh, uh, forces. But that ended uh, on the 1st of May, Labor Day 2006, when Evo Morales, the leader of the Movimiento Socialismo, Masi PSP, then president, nationalized Bolivia's gas, making it the first step to an economic revolution that led the plurinational state of Bolivia having an ownership and management of its national resources, uh, using the generated profits to fund social development programs that focus on education, health, science, housing, and economic growth. So the list of achievements is long, and we don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to put the most relevant, or not relevant, maybe the close to my heart, and I will focus on two to conclude my intervention today. One of the many uh, developments and achievements in, in, in the government, the socialist government in Bolivia, was that we had an introduction of an NHS-style healthcare system, free for all. The construction of more than 1,000 one, uh, health centers and hospitals. This is before the coup. After the coup, there are more data, and we don't have time for that, but it's, it's, it's as good as, it, as that. The creation of 20,000 items for health uh, doctors and nurses. The construction of more than 5,000 educational units. There were roughly 29 educational units created per month during the government of Evo Morales, AIMA. There were creation of five, 550,000 job vacancies for teachers. Construction of uh, 8,000 kilometers of motorways, meaning that the communities were able to, to, to travel and to study far, leave, leave the towns and, and brought more unity to the, to, the, to the country. And this is the bit where I'm going to put emphasis on. More than 150,000 families benefited from the donated free social housing plan. 50,000 families benefited with social housing loans, which is a very subsidized system to give a, a families a, a new home. And the last bit, uh, which is a rem re remarkable movement, which doesn't happen in every country, and I wish countries that we know follow, is that every, every person, regardless of whether they contributed to the pension, received a pension. And this all comes from the income that was generated from the nationalized uh, gas. And they call it dignity pension. And the two bits that, the two, sorry, the two monumental changes that happened in Bolivia, which of course then led to the coup, is the recognition of the 36 nations of the plurinational state of Bolivia. Bolivia has recognized the plurinational, na the, the nations of Bolivia making a plurinational state, giving all the nations of Bolivia and its people the legal rights, sovereignty, self-determination, and protection of our human rights. And the second bit was that Bolivia led a huge, uh, enormous movement to distribute and redistribute land. 70% of the land was before with the private sector. Now it's returned to 
because a lot of that land was returned back to the people, to the peasants, to the farmers, to the indigenous people. And that is a major, major movement, a major uh, economic growth for the country. Now, of course, this leads me to the last bit of my intervention. All this success is not good news. You don't see it here. You don't see it in the headlines in the UK. And this is what leads to coups because they do not want a successful socialist country. They do not want to hear that Bolivia took people out of extreme poverty, that we increased jobs, that we were able to educate ourselves, that we were able to, be, to have equal rights in a new constitution that the, that the country led, that the process of change led. And then is when we have the coup funded by the US, funded by, as, as you were mentioning earlier, funded by the UK. And this is the bit where I think it's really important to emphasize that all of the success that Bolivia has had, then it was thrown out because we had a coup that was paid by the empire. This coup, we were able to reverse in one year, but the only way we did this is by uniting and being united left. And I want to take a second to say thank you to everyone on this table who I know, and we, we as a movement, as Bolivian movements, we receive the solidarity. Without solidarity, we cannot make move. We cannot move. Uh, um, we cannot tell the world of what's happening in Bolivia because the newspaper weren't showing it. So this is what the importance of resisting. Uh, in, in our case, from uh, from where we reside, which is you know abroad, outside Bolivia, supporting the voices of the Bolivian people uh, in in country, and being able to have the support that we have, for example, from the press and everyone in this table, and know how supported, and we are eternally grateful. The coup uh, ended with 37 people dead, uh, thousands were injured, 1,800 were injured, 1,500 were politically persecuted, and uh, but we were able to push for um, elections, uh, democratic elections. We won by a slant light, a slant, slant, landslide. Ganamos, ganamos, that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and this is why it's so important that you guys continue to support us. Please visit Bolivia, document the successes of Bolivia, of the whole region, so we continue with this phenomenal movement. Hayaya Bolivia, Hayaya La Bellana. As a Brazilian, we are heading towards historic elections, which may seem underestimation because all elections are historic. But we are now talking about removing Bolsonaro from power, a fascist responsible for the death of more than 700,000 Brazilians, for the return of Brazil to the hunger map, for record rates of Amazonian uh, destruction and fires, for public policies that facilitated the oppression and death of countless women, Afro-Brazilians, indigenous people, and workers from all backgrounds who dare to demand more. To Lula, our first working class president who lived 30 million Brazilians out of extreme poverty, who created policies to include the most marginalized in society, who strengthened state-funded education, state-funded housing, and the integration of Brazil and an anti-imperialist cooperation project South to South, who has faced persecution, who has been defamated, who was unjustly imprisoned and suffered a great deal of political and personal losses, all in the fight for a sovereign Brazil not a subservient to the whims of empire. Many argue that Lula is not radical enough, that he's not Fidel, but Lula radicalism is not show and combat, but in action, with the strengthening of the largest public health program in the world, with the creation of Bolsa Familia, the largest welfare program in the world, and with the creation of public universities in areas where previously only the privileged had access to education. 
We Brazilians learned to dream during the Workers' Party governments. People who never had access to basics did during that government. And we know, as someone coming from the periphery of the capitalism, having access to the basics is unfortunately a luxury. But we had that under Lula. The 2016 coup against President Dilma was hard. Bolsonaro election in 2018 was painful, but as President Dilma once told me, dreams don't die, they are kept until they can be dreamed again. Next Sunday, we will have elections in Brazil. They are bit, and you can give me um, the support to the, make Brazilians have the ability to dream again. It will not be easy. Bolsonaro works for the international far-right movement and has radicalized his supporters. A victory for Bolsonaro wouldn't just be a victory for the fascism in Brazil, but for Bolsonaro's fascist allies through the world, across all countries. Today, I'm here to call for your support. Lula taught me that internationalism was a beautiful thing and that he stood in solidarity with the oppressed from all over the world during his life. Now it's your turn to show that support to Lula and Brazil. I urge you uh, to write to your MPs, to your trade unions, to local organizations asking attention to my homeland's elections. Brazilians on the left are being persecuted threatened and even killed by Bolsonaro supporters. We fear political violence because this is how Bolsonaro took office and has governed the country. Please, sympathize with my call for democratic elections for Brazil. Help us to dream of dignity again because this is what the election means. Dignity for me and for all the millions of Brazilians struggling right now. A dream of a better Brazil with Lula as our president. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Um, and I hope everyone will, will do as requested. Um, both of Claudia and Natalia have spoken about the importance of international solidarity, so please get involved as much as you can. Um, right now, we're going to go to Maria Jose Pizarro, who's going to talk to us a little bit about what's been happening in Colombia. Pues bueno, no hablo inglés tan bien como desearía, entonces voy a hablar en español. Para mí es un honor inmenso poder estar aquí, verme, ver nuestro país desde la distancia, el momento que estamos viviendo y poder ver también mi país a través de sus ojos. Tenemos una historia en común desde la participación de los ingleses en las guerras de independencia hasta el momento que vivimos hoy. Eh, ay, de... <risa> Uh, yeah, I don't speak English as well as I should, so I'm going to speak today in Spanish. It's a real honor to be here today to see my country uh, in this moment uh, from outside, uh, to see um, from the distance through your eyes uh, and have a look at my country in this way. We have a shared history right back from our independence fight. We had the British and English involved. Y bueno, vengo de un país que, como dijo, Mi presidente, mi compañero Gustavo Petro es uno de los más hermosos de la tierra, pero también es el segundo país más desigual de todo el continente. Hemos vivido décadas y décadas de conflictos, desde las guerras de independencia en 1800 hasta nuestros días. Pasamos por la guerra de los mil días, por la época de la violencia en Colombia que dejó más de 180 mil muertos cuando solo éramos 13 millones de habitantes. Y el conflicto más reciente, que empezó en 1974 y que se caracteriza por la expansión del paramilitarismo en Colombia, el surgimiento de las guerrillas eh, y, por supuesto, también del narcotráfico. I come from a country that, as my, our president Petro said, is, is the, one of the most beautiful countries in the world but also one of the most unequal. 
We've suffered decades of violent conflict. We've had wars such as the Thousand Day Wars, the period known in Colombia as the violence. And during this period, we lost 180,000 people of a population of just 13 million. The most recent um, period of violent conflict but started in 1964. And in the context of this conflict, we see the rise of the paramilitary forces, guerrilla forces, and also the phenomenon of narco-trafficking. Yo nací en 1978, en la época de las dictaduras del Cono Sur, en Colombia, el Estatuto de Seguridad. Mi padre fue Carlos Pizarro León Gómez, comandante del Movimiento 19 de Abril, quien firmó la paz en 1990 y fue asesinado cuando era candidato a la presidencia, 45 días después de firmar la paz. Y es... Esta la época en la que me voy a centrar porque es el origen del momento que estamos viviendo hoy. I was born in 1968. Seven. Seven. <laughs> <laughs> Just testing the English. Yeah. Born in 1978, during a period of dictators in South America, my father was a man called Carlos Pizarro. He was a founder and commandante in the M19 guerrilla organization. He signed a peace deal, as that organization signed a peace deal in 1990. 45 days later, he was murdered. This is the era I'm going to focus on, so I think it's a great importance of what's happening today. Entonces tuve como muchos de los niños de Colombia una infancia en la clandestinidad y sufrí la persecución estatal hasta que tuve 32 años y pude regresar a mi país después de un exilio de 8 años. Pero bueno, volviendo a esos años, según la Comisión de la Verdad en Colombia entre 1985 y el 2012, han sido asesinadas más de 450 mil personas. El subregistro nos lleva a aproximadamente unas 800 mil personas asesinadas. Si sumamos el periodo de la violencia anterior y este, y este periodo, periodo estamos hablando de que, que solo en el siglo, siglo pasado y principios del siglo XXI han sido asesinadas en mi país más o menos un millón de personas. Somos 40 millones de habitantes y los responsables son el paramilitarismo en un 45%, las guerrillas en un 27% y los agentes del Estado en un 12%. Mi padre fue asesinado en una alianza entre agentes del Estado y paramilitares en 1990. Si nos vamos un poco a la historia, los desaparecidos en el cono sur fueron 30.000 Nosotros estamos hablando de 120 mil desaparecidos en esos años. As many children lived, I had to live this uh, life in a context of uh, clandestinity and living in clandestine conditions. I suffered as a family and myself state persecution. I recently returned, or I re had to return to Colombia after living in exile for eight years. And as a report recently re released by the Truth Commission showed, uh, in a period uh, from 1985 to um, 1985, recent years, 450,000 people had been murdered. We can talk about 800,000 if we include the periods called the violence, which came before. So we're talking in the most part of the last century and the beginnings of this century, a small part of the beginning of this century, nearly a million people murdered during these violent conflicts in a country of just 40 million people. If we look at who was behind uh, these violent, uh, this violence, we can look at statistics which show the paramilitaries responsible for 45%, guerrillas 27%, and the state 12%. My father was killed um, by paramilitaries working in collusion with state actors. And if we look at the disappeared people in Colombia, uh, people often look at what happened in, in the south of South America, in Argentina, in Chile. There's a total of roughly 30,000 people who are said to have been disappeared. In Colombia, we have a total of more than 120,000. Tenemos 8 millones de personas desplazadas por la violencia que tuvieron que salir de su territorio 
precisamente porque luchaban por proteger el territorio de la injerencia extranjera, de lo que nosotros hemos llamado los grandes monocultivos o para extraer carbón, petróleo, para robarnos el agua, porque además somos el segundo país más biodiverso del mundo. En medio de esta guerra, 16 mil niños fueron reclutados forzadamente y tuvieron que luchar en uno u otro bando. Y hemos tenido también cuatro procesos de paz que vale la pena eh, exponer aquí. Los procesos de paz de la violencia en Colombia, Guadalupe Salcedo fue asesinado. En, la UP, en, la, en el proceso de paz con las FARC en 1984, un partido político entero fue asesinado, la Unión Patriótica, 6.000 de sus miembros fueron asesinados. En Colombia, we've seen 8 million people displaced, uh, forcibly uh, forced to leave their homes, their land, particularly because of trying to fight to defend uh, and protect their land from the interests of foreign investment, foreign uh, operations, uh, mining for coal, oil, uh, looking to take access to water, because in Colombia we are the second uh, highest country in terms of uh, biodiversity. We've had We've seen 16,000 um, children recruited into armed groups, forced to fight uh, in conflict. We've also seen four periods of peace processes, which is important to talk about. So we've had a moment, and each moment of a peace process, we've also seen an increase in violence. We've seen the, saw the murder of Guadalupe Salcedo, and in 1984, during a peace process with the FARC, There was a creation of a political party, the Patriotic Union. The party was uh, attacked and wiped out. We had 6,000 people uh, killed after this peace process from this political party. El proceso de paz como en el M19, mi padre, que fue asesinado, como ya les dije, y la constitución de 1991, parecido a lo que están viviendo Chile hoy, pero en Colombia la guerra y la paz conviven de manera absolutamente dramática. Y finalmente el proceso de paz con las FARC, que se firmó en 2016, pero van 315 eh, reincorporados que han sido asesinados. Y en medio de todo esto surge precisamente con el último acuerdo de paz eh, un nuevo sujeto social en mi país, que es la protesta social. El fortalecimiento de las organizaciones sociales y empiezan a darse toda una serie de movilizaciones en el 2018 lideradas por el movimiento estudiantil, en el 2019 por los sindicatos, el movimiento indígena, el movimiento campesino, movimientos políticos como el nuestro y por supuesto eh, las juventudes y ambientalistas y llegó la pandemia. Uh, the peace process, we had the peace process of the M19, which my father was involved in, and as I said, he was killed shortly after. This led to the creation of a constitution, a new constitution in 1991, a bit like uh, maybe what was trying to be happening in, in Chile recently. But in Colombia, we really live the conditions of peace and war side by side in quite a dramatic way. And then we've had the more recent peace process, in spite of a deal being signed in 2016 with the FARC, Over 315 of the former combatants who signed up to the peace agreement have been killed since. Since that deal was signed, we've seen a generation of a new context of social protest. We've seen a strengthening of social movements across 2018, 2019, led by students, indigenous communities, peasants, um, young people, trade unions. And this was developing and, and then we got hit by the pandemic. Y en, en el tercer pico de la pandemia se vio, o llegamos al estallido social, que seguramente ustedes lo vieron en los medios de comunicación, millones de personas salimos a las calles, sobre todo mujeres y jóvenes salimos a las calles, obviamente los movimientos sociales también, precisamente por esas brechas de género. En las regiones, en el campo, la gente que estaba en medio de la guerra fue confinada, por los grupos armados y confinada por el hambre. Y en las ciudades la gente tuvo que escoger entre el contagio y el hambre. Y eso nos llevó a ese estallido social sin precedentes, 
12 mil protestas en, en esos casi tres meses, en 104 puntos, por supuesto una violencia policial desmedida, 80 jóvenes fueron asesinados, más de 80 perdieron sus ojos y por supuesto 28 mujeres fueron víctimas de abuso sexual por parte de la policía o en estaciones de policía. Pero de esa movilización en las calles hicimos un llamado a una movilización en las urnas que nos llevó después de una campaña intensa de más de un año a ganar la presidencia de Colombia por primera vez en la historia republicana de nuestro país. Do I need to translate? During the third peak of the coronavirus, um, we saw the biggest protest that many of you may have seen in the streets of Colombia. Millions came to the streets last year, led particularly by women and young people, but also with the involvement of social movements, of course, as well, because we'd had a long period previous to that in the countryside in poor areas where people were forced into their homes having to choose between hunger or putting their health at risk. And um, this is then uh, what we saw come to fruition with the protests uh, or led to the, pr the context that led to the big protest last year. And there was an incredible amount of violence in response uh, from the police. We saw at least 80 people, protesters killed, uh, more than 80 people uh, with permanent damage to their eyes as a result of police actions, 21 wi uh, 28 women victims of sexual abuse, either by the police or when they were in police stations. But then what we called for is to continue that mobilization, continue that energy from the streets into the, the polling booths, into the votes. And this is ultimately what led to us for the first time having victory uh, for the left in a Colombian presidential election and congressional election. Además de eso, nos convertimos en el partido mayoritario. Pasamos en la Cámara de Representantes, donde estaba yo, de tres congresistas a 31. En el Senado de la República, donde estoy ahora, de, do, de 10 a 20. Es decir, somos una fuerza política en crecimiento, pero tenemos que, que cuidar ese crecimiento. Gustavo Petro es desmovilizado del Movimiento 19 de Abril, un luchador de más de 30 años por la democracia, Francia Márquez, una mujer negra de la Colombia profunda de Suárez, Cauca, y eh, por supuesto representamos esa Colombia popular. Nuestra apuesta es una apuesta juvenil, es una apuesta de las mujeres, es una apuesta cultural, por una transformación cultural profunda y por supuesto desde la alegría, desde el entusiasmo, desde el optimismo, surgimos de los años más duros de la guerra, de la violencia de las élites, del neoliberalismo, del capitalismo y por supuesto también de la lucha por la tierra, de la superación de los conflictos ambientales, somos hoy, como lo hemos dicho y queremos ser para Colombia, para nosotros y para el mundo, queremos ser una potencia mundial de la vida. We are a growing, uh, sorry, we also are now the majority party in Congress in both houses, uh, with the biggest party, sorry, in both houses. In the lower house, where I previously was, the, mem the members of that house, we had three representatives, we've now moved to 31. In the Senate, we had 10 representatives and are now in the Senate, and we now have 20 uh, senators. Uh, we are a growing political force, but we've also got to be careful and, and take care and, and be alert. Uh, Gustavo Petro, the president, he is a former guerrilla in the M19 uh, movement. He's a longtime fighter for social justice. And we have Vice President Francia Marquez, a black woman from Suarez in Cauca, uh, representing the uh, popular masses of, of working class rural uh, people. We are representing the, the people from these forgotten uh, territories in Colombia. Uh, representing the voice of women, of young people, this bringing this culture into our government, a uh, culture of um, positivity, optimism, 
joy. And um, we've now coming through, we want to push through and come to the other side of this long, dark period of war, of the extremities of neoliberalism, of capitalism, of conflicts for land, from the destruction of the environment. As we say a slogan, we want to be a world power for life. Venimos a plantear que la discusión de la lucha contra las drogas es una discusión global, que la lucha contra las drogas en nuestro país ha fracasado absolutamente, las drogas se quedan en Europa y nosotros no nos quedamos ni con el dinero ni con el crecimiento, nos quedamos con la muerte y la violencia. Estamos luchando contra el cambio climático, bajo ninguna circunstancia vamos a sustentar el profundo cambio social que proponemos a costa del medio ambiente, estamos en contra del cambio climático, es nuestra postura principal y es el mensaje además que queremos enviarle a América Latina en esta nueva ola del progresismo, nosotros nos paramos del lado de la vida, de la vida humana, pero por supuesto también defendiendo todos los tipos de vida hoy que las juventudes sienten que nos acercamos al final de los tiempos. And what we also want to talk about and bring to the table is a conversation and a look at the policy around the war on drugs. This needs to be an international issue and focused on in an international way because the war on drugs has failed. We see drugs taken to Europe, but in Colombia there's nothing. There's not the money, there's not the economic growth. There's just death and violence as a result of this. And also in terms of climate change, we're clear that we're not going to further our social progress and these uh, social issues that we want to introduce in Colombia at the, at the detriment to the environment. And that is the first message we want to be clear on. We are going to prioritize protecting the environment uh, as a government. Um, we want to be protecting all forms of life, human life and every other single life that there is on the planet. We're going to keep bringing that voice together and getting closer to the young people uh, today in Colombia. Por supuesto, traemos todo un paquete de reformas, no me voy a centrar ahí, las invito al jueves a que vengan a hablar nuevamente conmigo, pero eh, estamos en una propuesta absolutamente ambiciosa, que pasa por un cambio de paradigma, que pasa por una disputa cultural, en eso es lo que estamos y tenemos que estar todos los pueblos del mundo, tenemos que romper la inercia de la derecha que viene creciendo, sobre todo en Europa, nosotros planteamos poder hacer viable el cambio a largo plazo y creo que ese es el mensaje de América Latina en estos momentos de oscuridad para Europa y ese cambio de paradigma, ese cambio a largo plazo tiene que ser con las juventudes, tiene que ser conectados con la sociedad, toca entender los movimientos sociales y la forma de organización política de una manera diferente y por supuesto una agenda ambiental seria donde nosotros confrontamos el modelo económico, el modelo de consumo vigente y planteamos esa discusión para el continente. Hablamos de la integración de América Latina, pero también del diálogo entre América Latina con Europa, por supuesto con ustedes. La invitación es precisamente a esto, a construir un modelo de desarrollo sostenible, solidario, que mantengamos el diálogo nuevamente entre pueblos, nos han dicho que somos distantes, nos atraviesa un océano, pero créanme que somos mucho más parecidos de lo que imaginamos. Adelante, fuerza para ustedes, seguro llegará el fin de la larga noche para ustedes también. Of course, we have a big packet of reforms that we wanted to introduce. I'm not going to go into details now but we have an event on Tuesday, not Thursday. Let's see. <laughs> Tuesday here, aside Thursday in London. <laughs> and we have a very ambitious uh, plan. We want, uh, we want to change the fundamental paradigm, the fundamental culture in our country. 
but we need to unite all of us, bring us all together for these changes. We need to break down the control that the right has here in Europe and other places. We need to show, and we want to show as a government and, and, and shine the light that we are on in the progressive end. We are a viable option, and we want to offer hope for this dark period in many parts of Europe where the right is still so dominant, but it's so fundamental for the that for these changes to take place, there needs to, it needs to be done together with young people. It needs to be together understanding that there's chain, the changes that there are and need to take place within social movements. Uh, we need to be serious as well and show that we can propose an economic model um, that is viable. And of course, we're focused on uh, integration across Latin America, but it's also fundamental that we build links in Europe with all of you. We need to put forward proposals for uh, economic model that is sustainable, that, in, that is focused on solidarity between, the pe between peoples. And we need to keep building this solidarity between um, all of us. People might say, or you might think that because of the distance we are very different, but it's not true. We are the same and share so much. And hopefully soon we'll see the end of the dark days of conservatism that you're living in Europe. Para terminar, proponemos cambiar con la matriz energética, con la economía extractivista. Esa es la raíz de nuestro programa. Por supuesto, proponemos un cambio con las mujeres, o el cambio es con las mujeres o no será. Tenemos mucho que decir al respecto. Fuimos al sustento de la vida en los años más duros de la guerra. Nosotros... Y nosotras como generación no aceptamos un destino distinto a la paz y nos vamos a jugar la vida, nos vamos a jugar el todo por el todo, por construir no solamente un país, sino un mundo a la altura de nuestros sueños. Muchas gracias. And to finish. Um, I want to put forward this fundamental proposal that, that we have, that we need to change our relationship with the environment, we need to put an end to the extractivist industries, that is at the very base of our political objectives and our political program, but of course also focusing on building solidarity and building the rights of women. The changes will take place with women or they won't happen at all. We cannot accept anything but a country in peace and we are prepared to put everything on the line to bring about this peace and to make sure the dreams we have for our future can become a reality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. It was so inspiring to hear about the historic moment that Colombia is living at the moment firsthand. So thank you for that. And thanks to Hassan from Justice for Colombia for translating all of that as well. <laughs> Not an easy task at all. Um, the event that Maria was talking about is going to be here on Tuesday, 27th, 5.30 p.m. If anyone's interested in hearing more, please come. Um, we're now going to go over to Jeremy, who's recently been in Colombia, Chile, and Mexico, and he's going to share his thoughts with us on what's going on in the region. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this is uh, an amazing event to have hundreds of people here discussing the situation in Latin America and showing real solidarity. So thank you all for coming. And please value the work of the World Transformed in providing us with the space and the opportunity to have these kind of discussions, <laughs> which are too often denied in other places because we need those. But I also ask you, don't treat this as an afternoon out or an exercise in academic discourse about the situation in Latin America, fascinating as it all is from the 
presentational point of view, treat it as an opportunity to better understand what is happening in all across Latin America as a process, but above all, treat it as an opportunity for acts of support and solidarity for those newly elected left governments across Latin America who've got hell coming with a handcart to attack them for the economic injustice they are trying to right. We have to give our solidarity to them. Uh, and what I would also say is that uh, a big thank you to those people in many solidarity campaigns over many years who have worked with comrades from Latin America. The Chile Solidarity Campaign formed immediately after the coup in 1973, Justice for Colombia, and many, many other groups that have done so much over a long period, including the annual Latin America Conference normally held at the TUC, which has shown an opportunity for that solidarity to be expressed. And so I hope we can just think for a moment of the amazing achievements that have happened. And I will be brief on this. Uh, Chile is part of, if you like, a 50-year cycle of um, hope, repression, murder, killing, hope, and finally, a pathway, I hope, which will lead to a more egalitarian and socialist future, but none of that is a given. The hopes of those that managed to elect the popular unity government in 1973, and you just think back to that time, every one of their neighboring countries was a military dictatorship. The US was at their throats from day one, and the elite and oligarchs and military forces of Chile were funded covertly by the CIA in the United States to destroy that popular unity government. Allende was elected with less than 40% of the vote, became president on the vote of Congress, and governed in every way that he possibly could by mobilizing people in their hundreds of thousands in support of the government. The blockade brought about shortages, brought about food problems, brought about every other kind of problem, but the working class community still stayed loyal to the IND government. And so until the iron heel of the military came down on them and thousands were murdered and thousands came into exile. And I want to say thank you to all those Chileans that made their home in this country and have made such a massive contribution to our labor movement by their presence here during the years since that coup. <laughs> and uh, I've been to Chile many times and uh, on the last visit I was um, doing a film with um, Pablo's mother, Cristina Navretti, at Villa Grimaldi, which was the torture center in Santiago. And she was very brave. She walked around the site and described the methods of torture in each particular building of what she went through and what so many others went through. That is the lived experience of many, many people. And so the election of Gabriel Boric as the new president was a very, very important turning point. He wasn't expecting to win unnecessarily because of the uh, whole voting system and the um, way the media were attacking him and others. But nevertheless, he did win, and I was there for the inauguration, and it was a joyous occasion. A joyous occasion when he walked to the Moneda Palace and stopped and bowed in the statue of Salvador Allende on his way in, a lovely gesture. But that government has a huge responsibility now on it, to give rights and justice to the indigenous people, to give rights and justice to the women of Chile, and try to develop a political system that is truly democratic. The referendum on the new constitution was lost. We'll now come back to that again, and I guess Pablo will know more about that than me and will say something about it. But it is a battle for democracy, for social justice, and ideas that has to be at the center of that. Our solidarity is needed. And just across the border in Bolivia, think of the achievements of the movement towards socialism in, first of all, winning the election in which Evo Morales became the president, 
originally his campaign started against water privatization in Cochabamba, and that built up to the massive campaign that finally got him and others elected into office and a constitution that guaranteed indigenous rights, linguistic rights, environmental rights, and above all, social justice through access to health and education and housing and all those things. And then the lawfare, lawfare coup that was mounted against him, just as much as it's been mounted against Dilma and Lula in Brazil, removed him from office. And thank you to President AMLO in Mexico for providing a plane to get him out of Bolivia urgently and quickly to save his life in order to go back and campaign again. And Mass went back and campaigned again and won that election and are back in office. Well done them. They need our support and they need our solidarity. <laughs> and there is hope across Latin America when you have powerful voices that will speak out in solidarity with others. And I wanted to pay a particular thank you to President Lopez Obrador in Mexico, not just for his support for Bolivia, but also his very public and very open support for another political prisoner. He invited me to take part in the Monera, his very long daily news conference. It lasts about two hours on a short day. And um, he invited me onto the stage to sit with him and talk to him about a political prisoner in Britain, Julian Assange. And he gave <laughs> his support for Julian Assange and has offered Julius, uh, Julian Assange citizenship and safety in Mexico if that is what he eventually wants at any one time. And so I tell you all this because it's important <coughs> to approach it all with a sense of hope of the achievements that have been made the achievements have been made in so many countries. And the election result in Colombia was to me wonderful and actually a surprise because I was there for the first round of the election. It was the second time I've been in Colombia. We went to polling stations in various parts of Bogota, the richest parts to the poorest parts. And what impressed me in the poorest parts was the numbers of young women who were turning out to vote for Petro and Francia, the numbers that were turning out to support the left ticket there, and uh, very enthusiastic about doing so. The result in the first round was not as good as everyone expected by any manner of means, and we left actually slightly depressed, but I sort of thought, I hoped, mobilize young people, particularly young men, on social media to get out and vote on the second round, and they did, and the election result has been achieved. But remember all those that have been killed and murdered in Colombia over many decades, those that fought for land rights, those that fought against mining companies destroying people's farms and hopes and homes. And I've never forgotten on a previous delegation with Justice for Colombia going to a farm workers union quarterly meeting where we had a report from each region the report was how many union representatives had been murdered during those three months for standing up for farmers' rights. And bef on the day before the election, we had a very interesting meeting with a group of um, campaigners, trade unionists, land rights campaigners, all sorts of people. And we also had a meeting with a lot of young people, gig workers working for the equivalent of Uber in Bogota trying to organize unions. So I said to them, what happens after the election on Sunday and they said well if we lose the election we'll go out and campaign for union rights for labor rights for land rights for environmental sustainability and to give hope particularly to young women in Colombian society I said great good and what happens if you win he said, we go out and campaign for land rights, for labor rights, for trade union rights, for women's rights and workers' rights in exactly the same way. Because winning an election is one step. It doesn't bring all the changes. And so, obviously, we wish the government well. But to transition the economy away from a fossil fuel-based, um, multinationally-owned economy 
to something that is locally based, environmentally sustainable, and gives respect to indigenous communities and land rights to all those that have had their, la had their land stolen from them, and to give hope to the urban poor in Bogota and the other cities is a huge task and a huge ask. They need our support and our solidarity in doing that, and they need trade relations with Europe and Britain and the United States that are not penurious against the people of Colombia, but supportive of them as they transition their economy into something that is environmentally sustainable, which I guess is what we would all want for them. Next week, uh, the election will take place in Brazil. Lula is doing incredibly well in the polls and incredibly well in the campaigning. But you just have to look at the amount of money that's poured into Bolsonaro, look at the amount of money that's gone into the media there, and the film show that we've been showing about the coup that took place against Dilma and the imprisonment of Lula earlier on. It's an achievement to get to the state of having an election where Lula could even be a candidate to fight to win back the presidency. But your saying is absolutely right. Since Bolsonaro became president, the Amazon has burnt, the poor have starved, the land has been stolen, and the hopes of a whole generation of young people have been dashed by this uh, naked, horrible populism of Bolsonaro that actually offers nothing in terms of um, social change. He's like Donald Trump, but not quite as articulate as Trump in the way that he puts the stuff forward. But what we have to do is show our support and our solidarity for them. And that means mobilizing within all our communities, but also looking at the bigger picture in Latin America. Do not allow the sanction strategy of Europe and the United States to strangle the economies of Cuba and Venezuela and elsewhere. What we need is solidarity with the people of Latin America that they can decide their own course and their own future in our society. And I'll finish on this point. Many Latin American people have made their homes um, in Britain and in Europe. Some because they wanted to, some because they're political refugees, some because they had no viable economic alternative. Many of those work in the gig economy, work in badly paid industries, work in under-unionized places, and are grotesquely exploited. All those young women that are cleaners in offices in London and all the major cities from Colombia and Ecuador and Bolivia and other countries. The unions, the best unions are trying to organize them. They're trying to organize for union recognition and in-house in employment in universities and so on. Surely our job, our job as the organized left, if you, like, if you will, in this country is to work with them to improve their conditions here and their solidarity is part and parcel of our movement also, that leads us into campaigning to get the um, uh, expatriate vote to support Lula in Brazil as much as supporting AMLO and all the other left candidates all across Latin America. But I just say this. For all the history of Latin America, the, the invasion, the Spanish conquest, the oligarchs, the multinationals, the exploitation, the military coups, and all the rest of it, if you read the wonderful works of Eduardo Galeano, you'll realize that what th flows through Latin America is that wonderful golden thread of the survival of the pre-Hispanic Hispanic languages, the culture, the environment, and the hope for the future, that understanding of the survival of the human spirit against all odds. That is what has sustained them through the most brutal dictatorships, the most horrible, economic exploitation and brought about these election victories, but they are just a step towards the real liberation of the people through socialism and through social justice. That is where our solidarity must lie. And by the way, let's do the same here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I think that leads in really well to what John McEvoy is going to talk about now, which is actually the opposition that so many progressive governments, past, present and future, have faced, um, and that interference um, from the global north, from the US and our own government. So I think John's going to come in now and give some more details about that. 
I can just ask. <laughs> yes, yeah, tough act to follow that, but do my best. Um, yeah, so I want to talk today about Britain's role in Latin America, um, and particularly about how the British media represents Latin America or misrepresents Latin America, to to put it a bit better. Um, and as Jeremy said, it's an exciting time uh, for the Latin American left, and that means that. The, the forces of reaction, the force of the US, uh, the Latin American right and the UK um, are going to push back incredibly hard against this second uh, pink tide. Um, so, and, and the media is going to function as an incredibly important organ of this pushback. So I want to start with a quote from Noam Chomsky and then I'm going to elaborate with it to, to explain how the British media reports on Latin America. So the quote is, the basic principle rarely violated is that what conflicts with the requirements of power and privilege does not exist. Um, so simply some uncomfortable facts simply do not exist in the British media about Latin America, and that's specifically about British foreign policy in Latin America, British involvement in coups across Latin America. Um, and so the UK and Venezuela is an incredibly important case at the moment. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, in January 2019, Juan Guaido pronounced himself Venezuelan president. He'd never ran for office in his life, um, one poll actually put it that 20% of Venezuelans had actually heard of him. Um, however, under US pressure, uh, Britain uh, was one of the first countries to recognize Juan Guaido as president um, and actually continues to, re uh, to recognize Juan Guaido uh, today. Um, and in 2020, I revealed that there was a secret uh, unit within the British Foreign Office called the Venezuela Reconstruction Unit that was basically uh, designed for the, for the economic and social reconstruction of Venezuela. Uh, later revelations showed that their, their, their discussions focused on British control over Venezuelan oil supplies. As we know, Venezuela has the largest proven oil reserves in the world. Um, this caused a diplomatic scandal between Venezuela and Britain. Uh, the UK charge d'affaires, Duncan Hill, was summoned to uh, the Venezuelan foreign ministry uh, to basically explain himself, to explain why the UK was planning to reconstruct a, another sovereign country. Um, this fell on, on deaf ears in the British media. Nobody reported on it, even though it had caused something of a diplomatic crisis. Um, but this is also the case in terms of the, the negative effect of sanctions uh, on Venezuela. So in January 2019, once again, under, uh, under pressure from the US, Jeremy Hunt, our then foreign secretary, agreed to freeze roughly $2 billion worth of gold held in the Bank of England. That remains frozen there, and it looks likely that they're going to actually hand it over to Guaido, even though he, uh, he, he's in charge of no functions of, uh, of the state. Um, and since then, CEPR has done a study on the impact of sanctions on Venezuela. They found that over about 18 months, 40,000 people had died as a direct result of European and US sanctions on Venezuela. It fell on deaf ears in the media. Shortly afterwards, the UN Special Rapporteur on the negative impact of unilateral coercive uh, measures, otherwise said sanctions, did a report on uh, the impact of sanctions on Venezuela. And what she found was that, uh, new, once again, numerous deaths were being directly related to sanctions. And she specifically urged the UK government to unfreeze the gold in the Bank of England so that Venezuela could provide um, and buy uh, crucial medicine and food. Now bear in mind that in 2018, uh, the, the total value of uh, food and medical imports to Venezuela was $2.3 billion. So we're talking about roughly the entire value um, of Venezuelan food and, and, uh, and medicine imports is frozen in the Bank of England. Now once again, the UN Special Rapporteur's um, report was totally ignored uh, across the British media. So you have a kind of a, a litany of articles about, and, and obviously there is clear suffering in Venezuela and economic, economic suffering, but there is never discussion of who of, of, of responsibility for this. And of course, Britain uh, is partially responsible for what is happening in Venezuela at the moment. Now, this also happened with the coup in Bolivia. There was a second coup in Latin America in 2019, in November. Um, and a colleague of mine at Declassified UK, Matt Kennard, wrote an incredibly important article showing that Britain had supported the coup in Bolivia to get control of its white gold, otherwise said lithium, which is an incredibly important material for car batteries, phones, uh, phone batteries, and so on. Um, and once again, uh, this caused uh, a, a bit of a diplomatic scandal, um, and there were protests in Bolivia outside of the British Embassy, um, totally, totally ignored, um, 
by the British media. So when I tell people my focus of journalism is about British foreign policy in Latin America, they say, what? <laughs> I didn't know there was a foreign policy in Latin America. Well, this is one of the core reasons because British malfeasance and malign actions uh, in the continent are systematically ignored by the media. And these uh, uh, are inversely proportional to the actual importance of these stories. The British public should be made aware how, uh, how Britain is acting in Latin America. The second way that um, the, uh, that what conflicts with the requirements of power and privilege does not exist is that successful alternative social and econ economic models simply don't exist. Um, so in Venezuela in 1998, Hugo Chavez was elected. Uh, he stayed in power until 2013 in his death. Um, as I'm sure many of you will be aware, many of the, the, the basic socioeconomic metrics of progress uh, improved uh, literature, housing, healthcare, etc. Um, and so in, in a total of 304 articles uh, on, by the BBC on Venezuela, a total of three actually referred to the socioeconomic advances that happened under Hugo Chavez. And this, this was found by a, a group of academics at Cardiff, Research, uh, Cardiff University. Uh, similarly, between 1981 and 1983, only one in 500 articles published in the Telegraph, the Times, or the FT mentioned the social and economic progress that, that, that went on under the Sandinista government in Nicaragua. One in 500 articles actually mentioned uh, the, the improvements to people's lives that was recognized by all major human rights organizations, uh, particularly Oxfam. Um, so what you see is there's no, there's no discussion of the social and economic advances in Latin America. And, the, and the, the result of this is basically to kill hope, to kill hope about what is possible in Latin America, but also to send a message, or not to send a message to the British public about alternative successful economic models. Um, a third way that, that this process occurs is that uncomfortable facts don't exist until their potency is lost. Now, there's, there's a general perception that you know, imperialism doesn't occur anymore, it doesn't happen anymore. It's a matter of 30 years ago, um, and that's the case for the US and the UK. You know, the CIA doesn't engage in coups anymore. MI6 isn't interested in toppling leftist governments. Um, and incidentally, the 30-year uh, 30 30 period is more or less the declassification process. So after 30 years, you finally find out what the government is doing in your name, and this basically shapes the perception of what is happening uh, in terms of British foreign policy and US foreign policy. Um, and you can see this in more recent terms as well. <clears throat> With the coup in Bolivia in 2019, uh, the OS published a, 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 a faulty report basically saying that uh, Morales had rigged the election. Uh, within days, it was possible to, de to disprove the OAS's uh, report. Uh, CEPR actually did it within, within about three days. However, it took, it took the entire liberal media, The Guardian, uh, the New York Times. I mean, the Guardian's diplomatic editor, Patrick Wintour, actually was tweeting, uh, you know, it, it's horrifying to see Evo Morales stuffing ballots, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whereas it, was, it could be proven at the time that the OAS report was faulty. However, the liberal media and the media writ large only caught up with this when it was too late, when the coup government was in place and that nothing could actually be done about it. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that the the, the media is capable of, of critical analysis, but only at the point where it's not actually useful anymore. So it's therefore futile. And you saw the same with the case of Lula and Lava Jato. Uh, independent media organizations like Brazil Wire, to which I contribute as well, and Natalia does. Um, they were saying for a long time that the Lava Jato probe was corrupt in and of itself. Uh, it had ties to the US government, and it was clearly politically motivated to ruin the, the Workers' Party's chance of winning the 2018 election. Um, and, the, and once again, it, it was clear that this was happening at the time, but it took years uh, and the election of uh, neo-fascist Jair Bolsonaro to be elected, uh, and the damage was done before the liberal media actually caught up and reported factually on what had happened. Um, and the fourth and final way that, um, that the media reports on Latin America is uncomfortable facts only exist when ventriloquized through already discredited figures. So what the media does, it spends years, if not decades, um, discrediting certain political figures, be it Chavez, be it Maduro, be it, um, be it Ortega, be it Rousseff, be it Lula. Um, and it will finally only actually report factually when ventriloquized through these discredited figures. So let's say uh, Nicolas Maduro said that 
um, sanctions are having a devastating effect on Venezuela. Now, this is, this is a, a self-evident fact, but the, the content of the message is discredited because they eventually acquired it through somebody that they've been bastardizing for many years. Um, so, yeah, to conclude, we need to be ready for the pushback that's coming, um, that's coming against this, this second pink tide, the second wave of the pink tide. Um, and the media is going to play a fundamental role in, pe in shaping people's perceptions on the success uh, of the coming leftist governments. So yeah, it's important. You know, the BBC is not, a, is not an ally of radical popular movements in Latin America. The Guardian is not an ally of radical popular movements in Latin America. And we need to remember that when we're reading it. Cheers. No, thank you, John. And now I'm on that note going to shamelessly plug some of the alternative media outlets. So, We Palas por el Mundo. Yeah, por el Mundo in English. We Palas for the world, across the world. We Palas across the world, Brazil Wire, John Declassified, yeah, Venezuela Analysis, Justice for Colombia, which is following everything going there. So please, like John said, the BBC is not an ally and The Guardian is not an ally. If anything, they've actually propped up some of these really regressive regimes and provided kind of their own narrative for them. So thanks, John. Please check out some of these alternative media and Alborada as well. So I'm going to pass the Pablo now so he can finish up. Thank you, Rachel. I know we're um, nearly supposed to finish, so I'm going to just make a few points. I just want to say, firstly, thank you so much for to see, it's really great to see so many of you here. We were delighted that TWT invited us back uh, to put together a session on Latin America. We had a really uh, good one last year, and now we're in a bigger room, and, and yeah, we're really uh, great to see so many speakers give us these chronicles of resistance uh, and hope also, you know, John's work in exposing the, the dodgy practices and the anti-democratic practices of the UK government, which are hidden from us, are, are so important. So I think these stories, I think, fill us with the hope that we need here in Britain to carry on fighting for a, a fairer society. Uh, we're very far from that point, but we, we should draw hope from Latin America. Um, I was invited by TWT to write an article for the current issue of Red Pepper, an independent magazine that some of you uh, might know. There's a, I said to Hillary, the founding editor, that I'd plug the issue. So if you uh, go and visit their store downstairs, you can, you can see the, the magazine and grab a copy. Uh, and that article, uh, I uh, wrote about the resurgence of the left, this new pink tide. Um, now that first pink tide, uh, refers to the governments of Rafael Correa, of Evo Morales, of Lula da Silva in Brazil, of Hugo Chavez in the, in the noughties uh, that sprung up and gave so much hope to so, so much of the left in Latin America, but also around the world. Um, and now we have this new pink tide, uh, and it takes different forms. As, as Maria said, uh, uh, an emphasis on environmental factors that perhaps wasn't there before. And in this article for Red Pepper, I, I put down something that I thought was important, which was to say that there isn't one Latin American left. Um, there, you know, Latin America is comprised of around 22 countries, nearly 700 million people. And the new government of Gabriel Boric, or Boric as a, as, a, as a person, his outlook is probably very different to, say, Cuba's leader, Manuel Diaz-Canel. You have groups in Me Mexico, such as the Zapatistas, whose out outlook has sometimes put them, um, created tensions with the left-wing government of Manuel Lopez Obrador. So there isn't one Latin American left, but we can say that there is a resurgence of the left, broadly speaking. And I think that the inspiring way that Claudia, Claudia has spoken about what's happened in Bolivia under Luis Arce, the new president, and the fact that in Bolivia, um, people out on the street were able to defeat a coup, a coup a US, a UK-backed coup is truly inspiring and I think um, merits, you know, all our respect. 
because this happened often in the face of really, really intense repression. Um, another um, point was to say that Luis Arce, uh, their president, is someone that I've been lucky enough to interview twice in the last year. And I was struck by his humility, his wisdom, um, and his determination to bring his country um, to, to sort of repair the damage that was done under the coup by Janine Agnes. And uh, if you compare him to, to like a buffoon such as Boris Johnson, over here, it was actually quite depressing to be sitting uh, interviewing such a, a, you know, a humble, wise person, knowing that we had Boris Johnson back here in Britain. Um, as Jeremy said, I, we were in Chile together in March. Jeremy was invited to Boric's inauguration, and uh, we were filming for this uh, short documentary about the September 11th, the legacy of Pinochet's um, economics and politics and society, and this new beginning that is taking place in Chile since Boric came to power. And I think uh, what's key in Chile, and in Colombia actually, uh, in the in the protests that occurred in 2000, last year, and in Chile in the protests that took place at the end of 2019 that rocked the neoliberal establishment, the elite in Chile, and that paved the way for Boric's eventual victory in the polls last December, was the mass mobilization of people. People going on the streets, not being scared anymore of, of, of the repression that they would face. And so I think Boric is part of this new wave of leaders, different to the perhaps old. Um, he's part of a movement of students that came out on the streets in 2011. Many people in his government are part of that movement. And as Jeremy said, there was a very painful defeat uh, of this new constitution that was put to the electorate um, earlier this month. It was quite a resounding defeat, and there's a lots of reasons for that defeat. We, we did a panel recently that you can watch online, trying to unpick the reasons for that defeat. But it's important to say that whilst that was a painful defeat, a majority, a clear majority of Chileans still do want a new constitution. They do want to bury uh, Pinochet's legacy. So we should take heart from that. And the process in Chile continues. As they say, la lucha continua, the struggle continues. So we should support Chileans in finding the new version of that constitution that, that they find acceptable for their society. Now, um, I also want to, we've spoken about solidarity and Justice for Colombia, the organization that's brought over Maria Jose Pizarro. I just, last year I said it, and I think I want to, I think it's worth saying again, that they deserve a lot of respect um, uh, and thanks from lots of Colombians and other Latin Americans for the work they have done in, in uh, building bridges of solidarity between the workers' movement in Britain uh, and Colombians. During the dark days of, of Colombia's genocidal democracy, we heard the hor horrific numbers of dead, of trade unionists killed. And this solidarity by workers in Britain made very real uh, effects in, in Colombia, was very welcome, and has really contributed to this process in Colombia, I think. And it's sometimes worth recalling that what we do here does have very real effects. Um, and as John said, um, another aspect of solidarity I think worth mentioning is that we here in Britain need to build our own media. As John said, the BBC is not your friend. The Guardian is not your friend. Uh, we can clearly see that if we look at the hatchet jobs they did uh, on Jeremy, the hatchet jobs they've done on the Latin American left, misreporting, mis smearing, uh, lots of the processes that are underway uh, ignoring certain uh, atrocities, the magnitude of atrocities such as in Colombia, and ignoring what, uh, and misreporting what happens in, say, Venezuela. Um, so, I mean, my own parents are refugees uh, that came in the 70s from Chile. So, um, as a son uh, of refugees that was born here, I feel there's so much that we can give back. This country gave a lot to my parents. The trade union movement gave a lot. The uh, English people gave a lot, British people gave a lot uh, to, to my parents' generation, those that came. But we must all remember that the UK government today uh, does carry on its dirty practices in the UK. It was Thatcher uh, and a lot of other members of the British establishment that defended Pinochet, the fascistic dictator of Chile, up until the end. 
and shamefully it was the new Labour government of Tony Blair that allowed Pinochet to escape justice for crimes against humanity and allowed him to return uh, back to Britain, uh, back to Chile, sorry. So just to finish, uh, I just want to say that if we look at Latin America, what are the lessons perhaps? And I don't think there are massive lessons, but I would say that crucially it's been this mobilization of people on the street that has proved key, uh, key inflection points in fighting the right. Uh, this was the case in Chile, it was the case in Colombia, two countries presented as neoliberal icons to the world. And in Bolivia, the mass street struggle, I think also proved key to restoring democracy. So next Sunday, I hope to, like uh, um, Natalia and others, uh, be celebrating, I don't know when the election results come in, late Sunday, early Monday, but I hope to be celebrating the return of Lula to the presidency in Brazil. <laughs> Hopefully in the first round, uh, the end of the Bolsonaro nightmare. Um, I think if Bolivians overturned a coup in less than a year, a UK and US-backed coup, um, incredible. If Colombians can elect their first left-wing president since the formation of the Republic in 1810, I think the left can win anywhere, even in Britain. <laughs> Jeremy doesn't agree, but we'll see. <laughs> no. So let, let's build a new media. Um, let's uh, make sure that our government is called to account for its anti-democratic actions in Latin America and elsewhere. I think these are powerful expressions of solidarity we can give those in the region resisting on the front line and struggling to build better societies. We can draw hope from how the Latin American left in its many different forms is leading the fight back against the forces of reaction. So let's be inspired to do the same here in Britain. Thanks. Thank you, Pablo, 100%. I'm going to defer to the organizers here um, because we've run over time, haven't we? So have we got to vacate the room right now or can we go to just a couple of questions? Who's the, who's the decision maker? Wrap up, okie doke. Right, I'm really sorry we've got to wrap up. Um, thank you to everyone for coming. Um, thank you to all our amazing speakers.